So what I understood this week of postmodern culture was that it was a shift from one voice to many voices. Um, and Leo, Lyotard, L-Y-O-T-A-R-D, I don't know how it's pronounced, uh, I appreciated how he talked about a collapse of the meta narrative into a dominant culture with plurality of voices from the margins. So instead of just one true answer and one person having their say and what they said was right, everyone has a voice in determining what culture is. Another thing I liked that Story talked about was the rebellion against the elitism of modernism, just like there are many voices. Uh, also, they elevated pop art to the same, they, they treated pop art with the seriousness of real art. So pop artists and pop culture creations had just as much cultural significance as high art. So I thought that was interesting too. Overall, I found the readings for this week much more accessible, possibly because I'm living in postmodern culture, so I was able to look around me and see examples of postmodern culture. I thought the example about The Office was brilliant. Um, I liked The Office TV show, although I can't watch it alone. It makes me feel too awkward and squirmy inside, but if I'm watching it with a group of people, I like it. Um, I also liked how they cited uh, Best in Show, This is Spinal Tap, all of those movies. Those are some of my favorite movies. Best in Show is one of my favorite movies of all time. It's a mockumentary following a set of dogs as they go to this epic dog show. I love that movie, and so it, I was really excited to see it talked about. It's very postmodern, um, poking fun at reality and thus becoming its own reality. In my essay this week over the importance of appearance and image over substance, I focused on that in two main aspects of our society. First of all, in uh, po packaging, uh, product packaging in supermarkets, and secondly, in the political spectrum, especially in regard to female political candidates. Um, in regard to packaging, we always get sucked in by words like reduced sugar, zero trans fat, low salt, no artificial colors or flavors, but there are plenty of examples where if you actually read the nutrition information, you find out that isn't true. Two main examples, Capri Sun claims to have no artificial colors or preservatives or flavors or something, but then if you read the back, they have sugar substitute, which is an artificial form of sugar. Um, and then another one was there was a tortilla that said it had zero grams trans fat, but actually when you read the back, there was hydrogenated oil in there, hydrogenated soybean oil, and it turns out that the FDA rules are if you have less than 0.5 grams of trans fat per serving, you can say you have zero. So theoretically, these have 0.49 grams of trans fat, but they can say you have zero. So if you eat four tortillas, you are actually getting trans fat. It's not zero trans fat. So that's misleading. We, we get drawn in by those phrases and we buy those products because we want to be healthy or have reduced sugar. And it turns out what we're putting in our bodies is just as harmful. It's not true. The second thing I talked about in my paper was the importance of appearance for political candidates. And I focused on the 2008 presidential race when there were two female candidates in the running for high profile positions in the government and how they were portrayed and how their appearance mattered. Uh, Sarah Palin always dressed very feminine. She had wore very um, beautiful makeup. She was young, she was pretty. And then uh, Hillary Clinton tended to dress in more sensible pantsuits. She didn't emphasize her femininity so much. And the authors of a study I read said that political, that females in the workplace are either viewed as feminine or competent. And regardless of your feelings on the candidates of Hillary Clinton and Sarah Palin politically, how they were portrayed in the media had a lot to do with their femininity. Uh, Sarah Palin was portrayed as a ditz, she was portrayed as a beauty queen, she was portrayed that she didn't know anything. Uh, and then Hillary Clinton was portrayed as a ball buster, and there was actually a Fox News uh, newscaster who said, when I see her, I cross my legs. So her femininity was just stripped from her. She wasn't allowed to be both competent, a competent politician, and feminine. And Sarah Palin, no one could believe that she would be competent because she looked so feminine. So I found that very interesting. And, you know, political candidates, female political candidates, have to consider whether they want to look feminine or appear competent. And that's just a sad choice. And that's something I think needs to change. So that was what I talked about in my paper this week.